Now, I suppose uh, a lot of you think that the Pythagorean theorem came from a long, long time ago. It didn't. It was discovered 28 years ago today. I was in Alaska, and it happened that I ended up in an igloo with an Eskimo family. And there was the, the father and the mother, two, da two married daughters and their sons. And the, uh, the mother, or the, one of the daughters, had a 50-pound son. He was seated on a sealskin rug. What, the, the older daughter had a 70-pound son, and he was, uh, she was, he and she were seated on a tiger skin. The mother was sitting on a hippopotamus skin out in the middle of the igloo. And they got to talking about calories and energy and cholesterol and oat bran and all that stuff. Talk about their weights. And they found out that the mother weighed 120 pounds, while the son, two sons weighed 50 and 70, which was 110, 120 pounds. And that's when it started out. The squaw and the hippopotamus is equal to the sons of the squaws of the other, on the other two hides. <laughs> I thought you'd like to know that. Last year, I don't know how many of you remember, I want to take off from Peter Kelly's, one, just one statement Peter Kelly had, and that was concerning a sine wave. Each sine wave he said, is indicated as being made up of even smaller sine waves. Now, I've drawn on the board here a sine wave, which is made up of even smaller sine waves. Now, those smaller sine waves, there are at least a thousand of them, or approximately a thousand of them, in the, to make up the major wave. But it isn't just a thousand, it's one wave, there's the others, which are, uh, there are six waves altogether which make up this major sound sine wave. And uh, Peter didn't give us any number on it, but I've done research on the mathematics of it, the physics of it, and it appears to be that there are seven, and occasionally as six of these smaller waves to make the bigger waves. Now you've heard of the as above, so below. When those small waves are the frequency above, the, the large wave is the frequency below, the small waves create the big waves. The uh, seven different smaller sine waves form a single large wave. Now those smaller waves, in turn, are made of even smaller waves. Just take one wave of those smaller waves and imagine it to be that big wave. It's made up of smaller waves. Now we climb, every time we go to the smaller waves, we, we say we climb the waterfall. As above, so below, we climb several waterfalls. Eventually, we al arrive at the one energy, which was described, was mentioned earlier this morning. Now, the one energy is a, appears to be just a uniform single wave, which is continuously propagated in many directions, and is all one frequency. Uh, rather than frequency, I'd rather talk about wavelength, in terms of wavelength. But in frequency, this, I assume this wave, unit wave, vibrates at a rate of approximately a quadrillion times per second. Some say, say, some say 10 to the 40th. But it, this t uh, quadrillion is an arbitrary figure. Now, it divides itself up into prime number segments into two segments, 
two unit segments, into three unit segments, into five unit segments, seven units, 11, all the way up to about 97, where it was the top prime number. And seven of these converge to drop over the waterfall to make the next wave. Now you see up in the corner, I have shown the waterfall. I show one waterfall, another waterfall. I've shown numbers on there, but those, each one of those streams would constitute a prime number wave. And the prime number wave below 97. They are all on below 97. But the uh, best waves are the most uh, stringent quantumness occurs with a lower that prime number. That one energy, that is the basis of all quantum energy. And now every wave, as it goes over the waterfall, must have a two, a three, and a five wave in it. And if you go into the Fibonacci numbers, you find that no wave no Fibonacci number or quantum number can be formed that does not have a two factor and a three factor somewhere in it. And almost 75% of the time it has also has a five factor. That two, three, five, and then it'll have four larger factors. Now this is, I'm trying to give you a theory. And uh, how many waterfalls are there? Uh, in my experience, there seem to be about seven. or six waterfalls with a major track between. Now, each, between each waterfall, from one far, waterfall to the next, that appears to be also divided into seven parts. And I'll give an example later. Those parts are called are octaves. So there's seven octaves, useful octaves, between waterfalls of energy And uh, sometimes not that many. But I'm, believe, I'm led to believe that there are seven octaves per waterfall, seven waterfalls, seven stretches. I make 49 total octaves, and that agrees with some of the information I have in some places. Now, the first example I want to give is sound. A piano keyboard contains seven octaves, which is the hearing range, our hearing range. We're hearing seven octaves. We don't really use all seven. We lose an octave or two on the bottom, an octave or two on the top for usable melodious music. Now, let's go from there up to uh, visible light. Visible light is exactly one octave. Blue light runs from, uh, blue light is at 370 millimicrons. Uh, red light is 740 millimicrons uh, wavelengths. Now those are approximate. And for each individual, the blue light is twice what they see for red light. In other words, it has to do with the cones of the eye and sometimes your range is a little lower a per individual range, sometimes a little higher, but not much, maybe 100 millimicrons, no, not 100, about 30 millimicrons, maybe, difference. And so the difference between people, and the, uh, there's a pretty sharp cutoff on those ends for visible light, but that's one octave. And now, above this octave, and still between waterfalls, are one or two or three octaves of ultraviolet or far ultraviolet, and below are the same two, three octaves of infrared. 